is very, uh, unheard of. So even though the disease has been around for so long, we still don't know what triggers it. There's a putative trigger, there's a viral infection has been proposed or a, a stress in the environment, which leads to development of cellular autoimmunity. So the circulating autoantibodies develop against oneself, which leads to a uh, beta cell injury and this, this, um, this destruction of beta cells, leading to full-blown type 1 diabetes and a need for exogenous um, insulin injections. However, type 2 diabetes is a lot more uh, difficult to, to, um, to find out about. And actually, you might have started developing signs of type 2 diabetes 15 years before you even knew that you had it. So this is a really nice representation of kind of how type 2 diabetes leads to development of other complications such as macrovascular and the microvascular complications. So if we were only to measure our fasting glucose levels, so this is a period of 15 years, so 5, 5 and 5, we wouldn't know for about 10 years that we have uh, type 2 diabetes. Uh, Postprandial glucose levels can go up a little bit in the kind of um, latter stages, these five years here, where you might detect that you have type 2 diabetes. However, what has been happening within the body is that in order to maintain this normal glycemia, the pancreatic beta cells have to work so hard increasing this insulin secretion and therefore slowly developing insulin resistance. So by the time we get into the stage of diabetes being diagnosed, so known diabetes, we are already insulin resistant and our insulin secretion is already going down, which is why there's a need later on for exogenous insulin injections in type 2 diabetics as well. And of course, at this point, the fasting glucose well, uh, levels as well as uh, postprandial glucose levels are rising. So really, by the time we have diagnosed that we have type 2 diabetes, we will have already had years of exposure to hyperglycemia and development of macrovascular and microvascular complications. So in 2015, these are the figures from United Kingdom, really seven out of 10 people were either overweight or obese. Okay, uh, so this is quite a frightening statistic, especially for us in Scotland, for example, because not, we know the Scottish obesity rates are really high, especially amongst children. So these are the figures that are quite outdated now, and they will be presumably a lot worse, whereby we can see that 17% of children are obese. So this has massive implications for the future of the, of the people's lives. Um, so what can we do about it and why does it happen? So first of all, why is obesity such a massive risk factor for all of us? As I say, it's because we have this constant supply of insulin constantly being produced and therefore leading to a state of insulin resistance. So insulin resistance develops in about, develops in about 80 percent of obese cases. And this is associated also with increased levels of lipids, uh, oxidative stress, inflammation that comes with being uh, overweight and insulin resistant. And again, not only do we develop diabetes, but also cardiovascular disease, um, macro and microvascular uh, complications of diabetes. And now we know that there is a really close link between being uh, obese and developing certain types of cancer. And of course, fatty liver disease is a major uh, killer in the Western world. And I should say, if at any point you now have questions, please just post them and I'm really happy to kind of have a conversation about this. But really, I do, I'm just looking at, at the time and I don't want to spend too much time on, on this part. But why kind of why is it that being overweight or obese leads to all these terrible metabolic diseases? So we know that fat is there actually to protect us. OK, so people with lipodystrophy are severely ill because they have nowhere to store their fat. So having a certain normal amount of fat there is there as a cushion to protect us. But having too much fat means that this fat is no longer just stored within the fat tissue, but it leaks into other organs. So therefore, it leads into, it leaks into our vessels and our heart itself to lead to coronary disease and cardiovascular disease. Uh, our fat tissue itself, by being kind of enlarged, starts sending out stress signals and starts attracting pro-inflammatory kind of um, stimulus it secretes pro-inflammatory stimuli, recruiting white blood cells into it and really kind of creating a pro-inflammatory milieu within it. This leads to insulin resistance again. And of course, as I said, the fatty liver disease is a major killer. 
so what can we do about it? Uh, so there are already type 2 drug uh, treatments uh, that we or you would be prescribing to your patients. Normally, the first line of defense is going to be your metformin. We know that about 50% of people are also non-responders to metformin. And about a year later, if they do respond, they may require uh, additional therapy. So uh, really, there are some new drugs uh, that are looking promising, like SGL2 inhibitors are looking like really good agents, not just for type 2 diabetes treatments, but also for cardiovascular associated complications, etc. But why is this such a big problem? Why is diabetes such a major problem? So worldwide, it is thought to actually affect 422 million people. And the major problem to, in, in, is the wound healing. So about 15% of diabetic patients have delayed wound healing. And a diabetic foot ulcer caused 20% of all diabetic hospital admissions leading to amputations. And as the population ages, and as the metabolic and cardiovascular diseases are on the rise, the number of these chronic wounds is expected to rise as well. So in order to develop better medicines, we also need to understand the processes that are behind this. So these are the estimated numbers of people with major amputations. Uh, this is from Diabetes UK website, kind of rising year on year. OK, so it's going to be just an increasing problem. It's not going to go away. But what is quite interesting, and I, say, I think from a healthcare perspective, is if you put in preventative measures, you can actually stop this rise and stop this massive cost um, on, any, on the healthcare system as well as on people's lives. So these, this, these are two examples of NHS trusts, so Southampton and Middlesbrough, to actually introduce these uh, multidisciplinary foot care teams where patients would be recognized early, their feet would be recognized, uh, you know, they'd be checked often, and it would be recognized that, you know, they, they are developing these um, kind of chronic wounds, and there would be interventions much earlier on when you can actually do something about it. So it's quite interesting that uh, the cost that they put in to set up these multidisciplinary teams to kind of have a, a, a good collaborative work, and the savings that they made, the savings they made are absolutely huge, considering the normal hospitals would be spending about 639 to 662 million on their diabetic foot care. Okay, so this is an example where preventative measures are so important in order to stop things from deteriorating further. But to understand what happens in a, in a diabetic foot and why it doesn't heal, it's really important to understand how a normal wound would, would heal. So if you think about um, kind of um, falling over or stepping on something and the wound needing to heal, there are four different processes that the skin has to go through. So the first one is this kind of bleeding and hemostasis. So when we start bleeding, the platelets have to aggregate to prevent the blood loss. The next step is going to be inflammation, whereby the inflammatory cells, so the white blood cells will come to the wound in order to kind of stop the, the pathogens, microbes, etc., infiltrating and uh, coming into the bloodstream. The next one is going to be uh, proliferation, which is the kind of the growth of, of, of new vessels to try and, and kind of um, uh, re-oxygenate and, and give new blood supply to this wound itself. And finally, we have remodeling, which is the wound remodeling itself to restore its mechanical strength. Okay, so this is what happens in a normal tissue. Uh, I should maybe just talk, check with Dr. Susu if, if there are any questions at this point in time, or should I keep talking? I haven't seen any question in the chat so far, but um, okay. the floor is open for any question in the chat. I will let you know if I get any. And again, we encourage the audience, please yeah. let us know if you have any questions. The YouTube and YouTube surfing browser for Amokan. But login the APT session, click on it. Excuse me, who is, who is interrupting the session? Could you please mute yourself? Okay. So I'll, do, I'll just continue. So kind of when we talk about the four stages, as I said, the, you know, the first stage is actual hemostasis, which happens within minutes. So as soon as you as you injure your skin, you have to repair it to stop the excessive bleeding so that we don't bleed to death. So this is where our platelets come in. So um, they have to kind of create this blood clot here. 
to prevent the blood loss. And they will also provide the extracellular matrix that is required to kind of uh, have that scab formation. And there'll be a number of factors that will be secreted, such as um, TGF beta, as well as platelet derived growth factor, which will really activate and recruit other cells, white blood cells, to come in and kind of clean the wound, which will be our neutrophils and our macrophages. So as I say, this happens within can minutes. Can you hear your help? The YouTube, a YouTube surfing from Sahar, I'm sorry. Sahar, mute yourself, please. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so going from this kind of happening within minutes and hours, then the uh, inflammation kicks in, which kind of takes one to three days. So this is where our neutrophils and monocytes will infiltrate the wound to clean it. Okay, this is going to prevent the unnecessary tissue damage as well as eliminate pathogenic organisms and foreign debris. And what I mean about that is if you think about the neutrophils, which are the first cells that kind of respond to the epithelial injury, they will come in here and clear the bacteria and the microbes that are present at the wound site and they will stop the infection from entering the bloodstream. By the same time they do this, they will also release cytokines, so uh, tumor necrosis factor, alpha, as well as interleukin-1, which will allow other cells, such as fibroblasts and epithelial cells, to kind of home in and find their way in order to be able to proliferate into the wound. And they will also then recruit monocytes and monocyte-derived macrophages. And the monocyte-derived macrophages are really here to promote wood closure as well as wound healing. So when we think about the macrophages, they have so many um, different functions. And we know that there are different types of macrophages. There are pro-inflammatory macrophages and pro-resolution macrophages. But these macrophages are basically going to assist in the resolution of the wound inflammation as well. So they will stop the, they will reduce the number of neutrophils coming in because now their job is to phagocytose these kind of the bacteria or whatever may be around and clean the wound to promote its healing. They will also secrete their own cytokines and their own proteins like TGF-beta and VGF to kind of allow the process of angiogenesis, which is a growth of new blood vessels, which will allow that, that wound to heal nicely and reoxygenate. So it needs to reoxygenate to kind of stop the reactive oxygen species, et cetera, and inflammation being there. Then the third phase is the proliferation and the repair. And that can take anywhere between days four and 21 of the wound itself. And this is where the keratinocytes or the epithelial cells from the, from the edge of the wound will come in centrally to kind of try and um, uh, form a new epidermal base layer uh, and allow the new hair uh, follicles to proliferate within the two or three days after injury. And now there will be new or reestablished blood vessels uh, uh, to allow this reepitalization to, to happen. And of course, there is a repair again to the extracellular matrix and a kind of leading the wound to the remodeling phase. Uh, and these keratinocytes or epithelial cells, as we can see here, are really important in also phagocytosing the debris, that is the dead tissue and all the bacterial matter that would otherwise kind of obstruct their path. And they must dissolve any scab that forms there because their, best, uh, their migration is best enhanced by moist environment. So the wound needs to be moist in order to allow it to kind of form a, a bigger and a tougher scab to stop, uh, to promote healing. And finally, the remodeling stage, as you can see here, it says days 21 to 365. It can take a year or two years for a wound to, to heal, depending on the size and the depth of the wound. But this is really the transition from granulation tissue to the scar tissue. And this is where there is a slowing down of the angiogenesis process, so the growth of new blood vessels, and replacing of the collagen that is there, which is the type 3 co collagen, into a much stronger collagen, which is a type 1 collagen. And then the wound bed, uh, myofibroblasts, uh, can also differentiate into fat cells, reestablishing that layer of subcutaneous adipose tissue that you would normally find under the skin so that you have a normal functioning um, um, skin again. So as I say, once healed, the site is mecha me mechanically closed off and is functional, but it may take so long for it to reestablish itself. So for example, hair follicles may not grow, may not recover, and the, the actual healed site may only have 70% of its orig original strength. So as I say, there are processes that happen within minutes, 
to months. And this is again in a normal environment. But what happens under diabetic conditions? In diabetes, we develop chronic wounds. And this is because normal progression through these four phases is actually impaired or completely slowed down because there's a sustained inflammatory state in the wound itself. And uh, the peripheral blood circulation is occluded and it really we require a much better, better, better blood supply. But really the way that diabetes does this is because high blood glucose levels, the pro-inflammatory milieu that it creates, the macro and micro dysfunction that I talked about is already present there. And there's also autonomic and sensory neuropathy that can block every single part of this pathway. And really by understanding each part of this mechanism is how we come up of how we can come up with a way to intervene and improve uh, chronic wound healing in diabetes. So why is blood glucose, high blood glucose levels so, uh, so bad for, for healing? Well, it's because there's a stiffening of the arteries. We talked about macro and micro uh, complications, the narrowing of the blood vessels, and there's also diabetic neuropathy. There's a, there's a compromised immune, immune cell activity and really a decrease of the functioning red blood cells that can carry nutrients to the injured area to allow the healing. And as well, there's, a, there's extreme reactive oxygen species being formed, which damage the vasculature. So if you think about the normal wound, I talked about those four phases, we can see all these different cells cooperating together to, to seal off the wound. Under diabetic conditions, the, 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 the skin is not properly sealed, the pathogens can get in, the macrophage and macrophages are not functioning properly, there may be more M1 type macrophage, which is a pro-inflammatory rather than a pro-resolution macrophage, which is kind of M2 type macrophage. So you can see that it leads to kind of vicious circle. And then what happens is we end up with, with a scenario like this. We have different categories of, of chronic wounds. So we have venous leg ulcers, arterial ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, and pressure sores. But really, uh, for, the, um, for the time that we have, I would like to kind of concentrate on arterial ulcers because there's a reduced blood supply here and there's ischemia and severe necrosis. And this is really, really common in diabetes and is associated with a lot of pain. But what's really dangerous here is these diabetic foot ulcers which quite often will, will form on the heel or at the bottom of the foot and actually a lot of patients don't even realize that they have big deep ulcers within their feet because quite often maybe the skin layer may be there but the wound is actually deep inside. Uh, it's very common in diabetes and really associated with, with high, um, high glucose levels, the hyperglycemia. And this is really because there is a neuropathy already there. One of the problems with, with diabetic patients as you get dying off of, of peripheral nerves is that you don't feel the pain. And if you don't feel the pain, you can't respond and seek help um, on time, which is why I talked about those two NHS healthcare trusts whereby patients just go in routinely to check their feet. And the, the doctors and healthcare clinicians, nurses that work with them can recognize early if there's a problem and treat the wound on time. So as I say, this diabetic peripheral neuropathy is so common, and especially the longer you've had diabetes, the worse it gets. So if you think about the healthy tissue here, as we move towards closer kind of to the heel and the, and the toes, there's actual capillary damage, uh, and which leads to nerve damage and complete loss of sensations, especially in the extremities. And you basically get injury because you don't have the sensation of pain. And this is where we get into a kind of really serious gangrene and necessity for amputations in the patients. And the neuropathy is a major cause of injury. And really, this is the major cause of complications in, in the wound healing. And this is because high blood glucose levels destroy the nerves. They don't allow them to regenerate. And patients are increasingly less and less sensitive to pain in their limbs. And if you don't feel the pain, you don't seek help on time. So no pain to alert you that the worst is getting that the wound is getting worse or it's getting infected. And again, all those stages I talked about, the, the different cells that cooperate, the platelets that come in, the neutrophils, the macrophages, the keratinocytes, there is a there's a complete breakdown in that communication system, which leads to the wound getting infected and getting to the stage where it's actually no longer treatable. 
So really, kind of to summarize how diabetes perturb perturbs the cells that participate in the wound healing, the platelets that would come in first when they kind of when there's a sensing within minutes to hours, they become hyperactive, uh, they are activated increasingly, and they cause increased adhesion and aggregation. Therefore, they don't really do their job properly. The neutrophils that come in, they come in much larger numbers, so there's a really excessive infiltration, and they stay there for longer, which then doesn't allow allow the macrophages that would normally come in to clean the wound and phagocytose the pathogens to do their job. Um, and also, as I said, there are different types of macrophages and the macrophages that are present there are more M1 kind of pro-inflammatory type than the pro-resolution type 2. So every single cell that is involved in the healing process gets affected and uh, doesn't do its job. So what can we do about this? And this is what's going to lead me to the, to the research that we are doing in our laboratory. So the current therapies uh, for diabetic foot ulcers are um, tissue debridement. So this is where you, where you would remove the damage in the crotic tissue, clean it up to reduce the pressure, to allow the healing, and also to kind of allow the wound drainage. Uh, infection control, but patients are giving antibiotics, whether this is orally or topically. The problem is, these don't really work too well because they don't penetrate the wound properly, especially the, if the wound is really deep. So the chronic recurring uh, diabetic foot ulcers are difficult to treat. Uh, moisture, moisture balance. Uh, so some common moist dressings that can be used include alginates, hydrocolloids, and different types of films and pressure offloading. So this is a negative pressure wound therapy where a special dressing is attached to the vacuum pump to uh, the surface of the skin and kind of the suction will drain the wound and stimulate the growth of new blood vessels. They uh, stimulate that angiogenesis process that I talked about to allow the edges of the wound to, to close. And of course, blood glucose control is key. So if we can reduce hyperglycemia, if we can normalize glycemia, you'll be less likely to have these recurrent problems. But of course, as we've had diabetes for longer, this becomes harder and harder to control. But there are new therapies that are being tested, and some of these are from, from uh, that I've mentioned here, are from Aberdeen, from my colleagues' work, um, Heather, Professor Heather Wilson and Dr. Anne Reinichek, where, uh, where, for example, they're testing covering wounds with skin grafts and different skin substitutes or hydrogels that will basically, these are specially engineered webs that are uh, put over wounds to allow them to heal. Uh, they also use electric fields and magnetic fields and ultrasound to try and stimulate, kind of uh, re-establish the electric field within the wound itself for, this, for the wound to heal better, as well as shockwave therapy. Of course, there are other therapies like hyperbaric pressure chambers, which expose the wound to pure and pressurized oxygen, as well as stem cell therapy. But this is where uh, um, my lab really got interested in what we could do about improving diabetic uh, foot ulcers and healing. Uh, we work, uh, as uh, Dr. Susu introduced me at the beginning, we work on these uh, tyrosine phosphatases, the enzymes um, that are involved in insulin and signaling pathway. And one of these is called PTP1B. It's a major regulator of insulin um, and basically is a current uh, drug target for both diabetes as well as obesity treatment. And the interesting thing is that levels of this protein PT1B have been found to be highly upregulated in diabetic foot ulcers. And they're highly correlated to where the pro inflammatory M1 type macrophages are. So we can kind of hypothesize whether, whether we could maybe use PTP1B inhibitors to either modify the macrophage phenotype uh, or to just improve uh, diabetic healing. And really why we thought of this, and this is where the whole complications of diabetes come in, is because we have tested this PTP1B inhibitor previously in preclinical models of diabetes and severe cardiovascular disease. So these are the LDL receptor knockout animals. They develop atherosclerotic plaques and really uh, kind of a severe cardiovascular phenotype. And when we put these animals on a kind of Western style diet, high fat, high cholesterol, high sugar diet, they gain weight rapidly. But if we give them this PTP1B inhibitor in blue, once a week injection, intraperitoneally, 
they basically completely maintain their body weight. They eat high fat, high sugar, high cholesterol diet, but they don't gain body weight. And also importantly in red are the animals that kept receiving this diet and then got one single injection of this inhibitor. They also dropped in body weight. And what was really nice is that this body weight was directly correlated to the fat mass that they lost. So in blue, we can see here the animals that got once a week injections have much lower fat mass, even though they're kind of eating this the same type of diet. And the animals that got one single dose of the speech inhibitor also had a lot in fat mass. Uh, and this was sustained after they'd, they'd stopped getting the inhibitor. And what was really nice for cardiovascular uh, uh, symptom for cardiovascular um, assessment is that when we looked at the atherosclerosis and the plaques within the aortas in these animals, we could see that the animals that were receiving just a placebo uh, developed plaques, as we can see here in this red staining. This this is oil red or staining, with the, which detects the atherosclerotic plaques. We can see the animals that got chronic PTPMB inhibitor or acute had much much uh, lower fatty depositions inside. The arteries. So we thought, could we also use it for diabetic wounds? So I'm, uh, I'm a bit stuck with my, okay. So for this, again, we had to develop a new experimental uh, preclinical um, model, whereby we, we use animals again, who uh, receive diabetes. Uh, so they get diabetes induction with SDZ injections. They have diabetes for a period of six to eight weeks and they're super hyperglycemic. So their glycemia levels are between 30 to 40 millimolar. We then uh, do wound surgeries uh, and then uh, do daily topical uh, treatments with our inhibitors or with our placebo control and look at whether we get any improvements in the wound healing itself. So these are the animals that are uh, treated with vehicle, which is saline control. So this is on day zero. This is the, the wounds that are, they are all identical in size, six millimeters. They're put on their back. We can see here at day zero, these two different uh, animals have uh, open wounds. At day 10, um, the, uh, the wounds have healed, but they haven't completely closed. So you can see here that there's still scar tissue in both of these animals. But the animals that received PTP1B inhibitor treatment, we can see here that they, they basically have two wounds, each animal. This wound was a little bit larger, so there's a little bit of leftover, but the other wound is completely closed off. In this animal, both wounds have completely healed. So when we assess this quantitatively, what we could see is that, sorry, my computer is getting stuck now. I think I've talked for too long. <laughs> Now you have Wait. a question. You have a question, Dr. Mayela. Yes. yes. You have uh -huh. a question from the yeah. audience. Yeah. Uh, the question is if you maintain blood sugar uh, and increase the protein intake uh, for the uh, for the arterial ulcer, what about maintaining uh, blood sugar and increased protein intake? Will it work and help with healing? Um, so protein intake, I'm not sure why that question has come about. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting question, actually. So I, mean, I think maintaining normal, uh, maintaining glycemia is really, really important and the, probably the most important thing we can do. But the protein intake is, an, is a really interesting question. So there was recently a paper from John Speakman's laboratory, who is part in Aberdeen, part in, in, in China. And they showed this really nice data that animals, so these are preclinical models, animals that were put on, on low protein diets were really so much healthier. Right. So one of the things that people quite often do is that they will cut out their carbs and switch to high protein diet rather than high, high carbohydrates. But most of the preclinical um, models have suggested so far that high protein diet is metabolically really unhealthy. So there's a big difference between an athlete who is consuming high protein diet and needing that protein to kind of um, maintain uh, their muscle strength and muscle growth, etc., versus a normal individual. It is known that people who are elderly and frail do require higher amounts of protein to kind of stop that sarcopenia. But um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that in individuals, especially if they're metabolically compromised, such as type 2 diabetic, that actually high protein diet is not um, beneficial. 
And if anything, if we are to look at uh, preclinical models, and I know lots of people will um, say mouse models are not good models of disease, but actually every single therapy that has been found so far has been tested in animal models before it's gone into humans. They all suggest that high protein diets are not metabolically healthy, but quite the opposite. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, amino acids um, and changing essential amino acids within the diet uh, in our animal models. And we can see that if we decrease certain amino acids, such as methionine, for example, that we have huge uh, metabolic improvements in our aged and insulin resistant animals. So I think that maintaining glycemia will be a lot more important than suggesting to somebody that they should be eating high protein diet. Especially when I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about alpha cells and beta cells being able to respond under normal physiological conditions so that, you know, to kind of counteract that hypoglycemia. But that is under normal physiological conditions. If somebody's already got type 2 diabetes, that balance of how, this, how the alpha cells and beta cells can respond is going to be quite different to a normal body. So I don't think there's enough evidence at the moment to suggest that we should be telling people to eat more protein. It's again about where your protein comes from, I would suggest. Kind of thinking about uh, switching things to high fiber uh, consuming diets like vegan diets. We know the vegan diets are incredibly healthy. So if we're going to think about that, I would suggest that people should be eating a lot more plant-based materials and plant-based proteins uh, rather than animal-based proteins. I hope that answers the question from, from, yeah. Oh, yes, okay, Rim, thank you. And really, I just wanted to, I, I'm really happy somebody's asked questions and please feel free to ask more questions. I just wanted to show you that this kind of uh, treatment that we have just tested uh, appears to be improving wound healing in our hands. So I'm really hoping that, you know, there are new therapies coming along that are pharmacological therapies uh, that, that could be helpful. But as I said, there are other things that are non-pharmacological, like using electric fields and changing the, the you know, there is, it has been shown previously that the, in diabetic patients, the electric field in the wound is completely changed. The current within the wound is changed. So if we can rebalance that, that could be a nice non-pharmacological intervention to help the patients, I think. Um, so really, this is kind of bringing everything together of, of the preventative measures that could be done. Uh, and I, I would like to kind of reiterate how important it is preventative work rather than trying to uh, change something once it's, once it's already been established. Uh, so this is me and my presentation, but I'm really happy to answer any more questions if there are some, or I can answer some at the end when there are questions for everybody. Thank you very much, Professor Marella. This is very informative presentation, and I certainly learned good stuff. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. If you have any question for now, you also could type your questions in the chat. We could answer them after uh, the session. It's up to you, but please feel free to interrupt at any point and ask questions. Uh, I just like to add a comment regarding the vegan diet and the plant-based food. Uh, I think the other benefits in it that it's rich with anti-inflammatory, immune modulatory flavonoids and all these compounds that may help modulate how the innate immune system would function and maybe uh, reduces the macrophage dysfunction. So what do you think of that notion? Yeah. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with you. The phyto, yes, yes, a hundred percent. I mean, we do some work with the carotenoids and vitamin A derivatives, and you're absolutely spot on. It's kind of stimulating those pro-resolution pathways, the switching to the M-type subtype of, of, of macrophage and releasing kind of a pro-resolution inflammatory um, interleukin tens and arginase rather than interleukin one and TNF alpha. So you're absolutely spot on. So um I'm a big supporter of plant-based diets and plants plant-based proteins, uh, but I wouldn't be recommending at any point people going and switching to whole chickens. <laughs> you know, that was at the beginning of the presentation. So absolutely, absolutely. All right. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Have a um, good change. All right. So I'm going to uh, share my slides right now. 
and take you through a focus on diabetic foot infections. But in this talk, you already heard all the background about uh, diabetic foot ulcers that occurs and uh, all the complications in diabetic patients. What I'm going to do is take you through a shorter journey focusing on the infections themselves and the pathogenesis. How does that occur? From the bacterial virulence point of view uh, to say. So uh, you already heard by now that these foot ulcers or diabetic ulcers are occurring in diabetic patients and they are leading to devastating consequences sometimes. 30 to 40% of the patients they experience uh, diabetic foot infections and 24% of those patients will end up with amputation. So there is a huge devastation, but how things move from here to here to here, uh, you already heard the host part of it, how the immune system is not functioning, how the wound healing is not appropriate. And now I'm going to take you a little bit more into the microbiology of the infection and how the host pathogen interaction is complicating the wound healing process. So again, just to remind everyone the problem with diabetic foot uh, syndrome that it's a complication of multiple things. Reduced uh, blood circulation or angiogenesis problem or a vasculature blood circulation problem it's deep, deep ulcers, so um, the treatment would be quite challenging and difficult. And also the neuropathy, they do not have the proper sensation to feel that the problem is upcoming uh, into there. So it's a mixture of several things that lead to this phenomenon. But what happens then, uh, as been stated, these infections could go mild, which is just on the surface. Uh, wound healing would be easier and faster, especially if it's attended quite early in the process of ulceration. And then there's the moderate where it shows like some ulceration, but internally it's a deep abscess or infection and where it's severe and usually may lead to devastating outcome. Again, just to remind everyone what Professor Mirella had told you, the high blood sugar for years in the circulation would affect the health of the vasculature system, will affect the nerves, that's the neuropathy, and will suppress the immunity. So the complication of all these together would lead to diabetic foot. And you may hear about foot gangrene, and this is where I'm going to inform you how these foot gangrenes may occur. Um, the risk factors for predisposing to this has been explained. When the skin is having thick layers, callus, hyperkeratosis, already there is some uh, neuropathy, so the sensations are reduced. And on top of it, having this layer of callus will complicate the problem. They would not even feel that they're getting the infection till it's already deep and established. And of course, with reduced blood flow and circulation to the area, reduced activity uh, and circulation of functional immune cells that usually sense the presence of perturbance, pathogen invasion, and phagocytosis, and take care of it. So this arm of the innate immune system is also getting Im impaired. And of course, they have metabolic instability, and uh, all of it complicate the process that naturally people would take care of infections by their immune system unless it, it's very serious and needed therapy. But with the delayed wound healing, in the diabetic patients, there is a safe haven for the pathogens to hide and survive and wreak more havoc in the system. And of course, they have many virulence factors that they start secreting and producing, and I will explain a little bit uh, about that. But as a predisposition to this 
condition usually the foot pad the fat pad here when it's reduced and there's some callus in there the the protection for the foot is reduced or hampered and that's why it would be at higher risk of ulceration because also of the pressure on the foot again the early detection is very helpful because once the ulceration started and inspected and treated, although it takes longer time than usual to heal, but it's manageable. But if it's not treated, it will go out of control and will continue to be a chronic infection with polymicrobial pathogens there and impaired wound healing. You already heard this part of the wound healing process, so I'm going to skip. But just to take you through the grades of diabetic foot ulcer and how does it come into play. So uh, when patients go to inspection, they inspect their foot if they have a lesion or not, the pressure sore or the ulcer uh, place. That's a grade zero. There is a risk that it might in the future develop into a grade one superficial ulcer where the skin layer, the outer layer, the epidermis is eroded and uh, exposing the inner layers and opening the chance for infection. Then the deep ulcer comes in and that's open wound now and that's when it's open for bacterial pathogens. So when you have impaired healing and necrotic and dead cells right there there is a feast for bacteria to feed on these dead immune cells or dysfunctional tissue cells and reproduce and proliferate more and more so when there is an open feast open buffet for these pathogens they just proliferate and they go deeper and some of these pathogens they do not like oxygen. They are anaerobic bacteria. And with the reduced uh, circulation over there and with the deep ulcer, these pathogens, they thrive quite well in the deep ulcer because they have the anaerobic environment, they have the abundance of food and nutrient, and the war is to their advantage because with the host pathogen, interactions or war, the host is delayed in its responses and the bacteria is or the pathogens are having so much fun. Then the wound and the ulcer and the abscess gets deeper till it reaches uh, the bone. So that's why it, it goes deeper into the muscles and the deep skin layers and reaches the bone. And that's really very difficult to heal and treat because antibiotics would find it very difficult to reach that deep side of the infection, let alone that there are several uh, pathogens that polymicrobial, as we said, nature of these infections. Once the wound gets into this grade four, it's really critical. You would see this, what we call the gangrene. The gangrene meaning that the tissue is dying. The black color because of the necrotic cells, because of the dead tissues, because the circulation is not reaching there, and already the bone and the skin and the tissues, muscle down there, are all infected and exposed. And that, when the gangrene starts, it, it spreads much faster. That's what really leads to amputation. So from the pathogen perspective, when they get into these deep holes in the ulcer or deep wound, they start producing a lot of virulence factors, toxins. What kind of toxins they produce? For example, they produce toxins that would lyse red blood cells. Here comes the red blood cells to, to do the regular vasculature business, carrying oxygen and transporting CO2, but then the um, toxin, the hemolysin secreted from the pathogen would break open these red blood cells and release the iron from the hemoglobin for their source of survival. 
in addition to many other cells that they degrade, they produce enzymes that degrades the keratin. They produce enzymes that degrades the uh, host tissue cells. So there will be a lot of virulence factors, secreted enzymes and uh, compounds that would degrade the host tissue. And so all these toxins from the bacteria would conquer the effort of the host to uh, survive and remove the pathogen, and we end up having this devastating uh, deep uh, ulcer. Again, this is the same thing. There's stages. There's the Wagner uh, classification that's used in clinical um, settings to assess the degree of uh, diabetic foot ulcer and what should be done about it. If it reaches this stage of gangrene, it's almost irreversible. It's amputation. Now, I want to show you this case that been published in New England Journal of Medicine and why we should care about diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, and as Dr. Mirella said, there should be a preventive approach like diagnosing these ulcers early and taking care of them early would prevent the amputations. So this case in particular, this patient had this ulcer here, which is mild diabetic foot ulcer for three years. For three years, it did not change, but you could see the ulceration is there and it's dormant. Day one, admitted to the hospital because there's clearly an amplification in the infection right there. So there's the swelling and the active process of inflammation and infection is apparent. It goes by the day from day one to day five, there's already a very deep ulcer and very wide ulcer. By day nine, it's total gangrene and same thing by day 10. So in 10 days, a dormant diabetic foot ulcer had changed from that simple uh, manifestation here into the devastating necrotizing tissue ulcer that would lead to amputation. Um, the pathogens, bacterial, and it's mostly bacterial pathogens, and some often there's some yeast candida would join with them, but mostly it's bacterial pathogens that are responsible for these diabetic foot infections. And as I said, it's polymicrobial. So if you're a physician or a healthcare giver, when you receive the microbiology report, you will notice that there are more than one organism that has been isolated here. The problem with polymicrobial infections that which antibiotic to use that covers the spectrum of all these infections and how long to use it and would it work or not. So that's another challenge is the management and treatment. But generally speaking, it's, as we said, a hybrid of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. As you know, the pathogens, the bacteria, they're divided into two major groups, gram-positive and gram-negative, and the difference occurs in their cell wall, in the outer layer mostly. The gram-positive, they have a very thick peptidoglycan layer, whereas the gram-negatives, they have a thin one, but they have endotoxin in the membrane layer. That means which antibiotic you use to penetrate the cell wall or inhibit the cell wall synthesis usually differ between gram-positive and gram-negatives. In the Middle East area, it's the majority of infections are caused, as you could see, by Pseudomonas species, which is a gram-negative bacteria, and Staphylococcus aureus. The problem with Staphylococcus aureus is you heard the term MRSA, methicillin-resistant staphylococci. So not only you'll have a mixture of different bacteria, they carry determinants of antibiotic resistance. And so that makes it even much harder to treat the diabetic foot infection if they end up having antimicrobial resistant pathogen in the mixture down there. So um, another 
compounding problem that will add to the well-being and the management of diabetic patients. So without going through much details, there's a lot of uh, these infections that, as I said, occur as my polymicrobial, and it has to be treated uh, urgently. We explained about the problem, how does it occur, but for the management, simple infections or the early stage infections are treated with oral antibiotics because the ulcer is not deep yet, and there's a good chance using topical antibiotic in addition to oral to take care of it. However, if it's deeper ulcer or more complicated, the patient has to be admitted to take the IV uh, antibiotic. It cannot be just treated by oral or topical. It's not going to work. It has to be parenteral uh, intravenous antibiotic administration. To remind everyone that diabetic foot care is playing a very important role in reducing the burden of diabetic foot ulcer. Again, there are a list of precautions that diabetic patients will be informed how to take care of their feet to prevent these ulcers from happening, but also being examined by a professional podiatrist who would spot right away if there's any chance of ulcer beginning to develop or etc. Um, you could find the instruction anywhere you look for it, but simply patients with diabetic uh, nephropathy, neuropathy, they are advised to daily take care of their feet, not to be harsh on them, to keep them moisturized, to prevent the callus from being uh, happening or occurring, and also keep them warm because that helps to uh, due to the reduced sensation, the neuropathy helps the foot and the circulation. So the diabetic foot care is a preventive measure that we should educate diabetic patients um, um, importantly how to take care of themselves. Now I'm going to take you to innovative uh, approaches to detect and spot and reduce diabetic foot ulcers. You know, nowadays we are living in the digital uh, fourth industrial revolution, the Internet of Things and the smart technologies. So uh, implementing all these smart technologies with uh, connected to the Internet or to your phone, as said here, designing a smart socks that when the diabetic patient wears them, the uh, sensing fibers will conduct the pressure points and send a signal and alert the patient. So this kind of uh, smart socks they're called, it's just to alert for the pressure points that are building and developing. So this is one of the innovation that it's uh, happening right now. Another innovation where these smart shoes that would have like those pressure uh, shock absorber, they absorb the pressure, so it won't hit the foot of the patient, it will absorb the pressure and that saves uh, the feet from getting ulcered or sore. Of course, as Dr. Mayrella said, there are many more uh, innovations right now, and whether in research or in current development to use these smart bandages with smart nanomaterial that would go penetrate deeper or try to activate the wound area to heal faster and to um, deliver antimicrobial effects into the deeper tissues where, where it's hard to reach. Um, however, the best uh, prevention, best way is to prevent these infections from happening rather than wait till it's complicated and then treated. I will stop here and see if you have any question. I'd be glad to answer it. So if you have any question, please type your questions and I'd be glad to answer it. Audience? All right. 
can I ask you a question if that's yes. okay? Yes, yes, go ahead. How do these, how do the smart shoes work? I mean, I've not heard of them. That sounds really quite amazing. What is the technology behind it? Do you know? <laughs> yeah, you see those um, shock absorbers. They are small little uh, thingies that are placed in the sole of the shoe. And uh, just like if I may uh, make the analogy to the shock absorbers in the car, like when you hit something, the shock is absorbed. Same thing with those uh, little sensors right there. They absorb the shock and prevent the pressure from hitting into the ulcer. So it's more mechanical engineering mm -hmm. kind of thing. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? All right, so um, for now, I would like to give the uh, floor to Ms. Dina to share with us her part about the economic burden of diabetic complication, and we look forward to that. Uh, floor is yours, Ms. Dina, go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Susu. And uh, I would like also to thank Dr. Ramirela and Dr. Susu for their fruitful presentations. And I'd like also to thank everyone who joined us today in today's important uh, sessions on uh, diabetes complication, and especially those who made it to the last part about economic burden of uh, diabetes. It's really a pleasure for me to be part of uh, today's uh, uh, team. So, um, First, I have no conflict of interest to disclose in today's uh, slides. And these are the outlines that I'm going to cover. So let's start by giving some brief introduction about health economic evaluation. And then I will move to talk about the global as well as local economic burden of diabetes. And then we'll think of some of the omitted uh, social burden of diabetes. And if there is a way to get out of this. And finally, we'll end up with a uh, short, interesting case discussion. Now, I'm sure some of you or some of the uh, participants have a brief introduction or sort of brief uh, background about uh, economic evaluations, and some of you are interested to know more uh, about economic evaluation or why it's important to consider health economic evaluation in our daily uh, practice. Now, decision makers face a huge challenge of balancing the increasing healthcare demand with the cost containment. Now, those who work or deal or provide or receive healthcare services face a huge number of questions in their mind. For example, they ask themselves, should hospital purchase every single new diagnostic tool? Or for example, should a new expensive drug be listed immediately on the formulary? If I ask our participants, for example, um, I just want to uh, hear their uh, thoughts. Uh, would you consider, for example, to add any new approved medication um, to your uh, hospital formulary? Anyone would love to share with us uh, his thoughts or? Please type your uh, answers in the chat. Um, I think I cannot see the chat box. There's nothing in the chat so far. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> okay, these are just examples of the questions that um, uh, come in their mind. And um, so the answers to these questions are highly influenced by the value of the alternative courses of action that they pose. Now, since choosing one course of action will not only have effects on the health, but will also have effects on the health resources as well as the effects that uh, not related directly to the healthcare system. So it's all, always important to uh, to think and to consider and always remember that informing healthcare decisions requires consideration of both cost and benefits. So the overall aim of health economic evaluation is to inform decisions. We need to produce outputs. Now, in order to produce outputs, of course, you need inputs. And since we are talking about uh, costs and benefits, of course, you need health inputs plus economic inputs. Now, these health inputs are, uh, uh, much of this evidence comes from results of clinical evaluation, for example, from RCTs or from medical records, if you have a uh, for example, electronic uh, medical records, or some countries have big national registries. 
While the economic input can be easily obtained from either local or international databases. Now, sometimes we, because you need to, to in, in health economics, we need to be comprehensive as much as possible. So sometimes where we may not find specific input from, uh, uh, for a specific output. So we, we go with assumptions, we, we make assumptions. And some people may think that it's, um, it's, uh, it's not a robust approach, and I agree with them. It has uh, some uncertainty, but we can easily address this in our economic uh, evaluation. Now, but be careful and be, be aware. Can you just take any result from any randomized control trial as it is to your economic evaluation? Of course, no. You need to um, to check the quality of that RCT. For example, you need to um, uh, the the results need to be sought in a very systematic way. You need to ask to ask yourself, for example, are these re uh, results relevant to your setting? Are these results um, uh, relevant to your population? Any bias? So, think of all these questions before you decide to select.